I'm gonna start with a question. You can win if you lose a DPS, you can win if you lose a support, but why are fights where you lose a tank by far the hardest to win? Facts are, the tank has more health, mitigation, and in many cases, more damage than any individual hero in the other roles. If we can say that losing a tank first is most often the worst scenario, then logically we can conclude that the tank is the most valuable player, aka the MVP when it comes to winning. This doesn't mean the tank player is always the best player, it just means they're the most valuable. So the million dollar question is, why does being the MVP feel like sh to most people? Well, we have to first ask, why do people play tank in the first place? The reason most people end up playing tank is because there's a hero or heroes in the tank category with a look, personality, background, or playstyle that they enjoy. This is true for any other role. However, this role isn't like any other role. There's only one tank, and like we established earlier, they are the MVP. And because of this, players will do whatever it takes to deny the tank of value. One of the easiest ways to do that is to counter swap, which this gives the MVP two options. Counter swap back, which means they're no longer playing the hero they enjoy playing, or option two, try to outplay the counter. And that right there is the problem with tank in Overwatch 2. The lack of outplayability. You could also just say they're not flexible. Some tanks have it worse than others, but all of them deserve better. In this video, I'm gonna highlight what I find makes certain tanks unfun and offer one of many solutions to make them better. We'll start with top of the list, Winston. The counters to Winston are shotgun and minigun heroes. Reason being, they can destroy both him and his bubble very quickly. This makes it near impossible for Winston to go in, disrupt, and make it out alive. My proposed solution is to change his alternate fire. Instead of being a poking tool, what if we reduced the damage and instead made it a weapon jammer? A smart Winston will use it on heroes like Bastion or Mauga, and that's to stop them from winning fights by just holding down the shoot button. And at the same time, it's just a weapon jammer, not an ability jammer, so yeah, Ana can still use Sleep Dart. Things like how long the jamming lasts or the range would have to be playtested, but in the big picture, this would make Winston counters more manageable without making Winston unstoppable like he would be if we buffed his health or bubble. Let's move on to another people's favorite, Reinhardt. Regardless of how popular or viable this hero is, throughout most of Overwatch 2, the Reinhardt player base has complained about him. Why? Well, it's because they're either nostalgic for Overwatch 1 Reinhardt or their favorite streamer complains, so they just copy them. Okay, so what made Reinhardt fun in Overwatch 1? Most people watching this right now are saying in their heads, Ryan Zarya. But Ryan Zarya didn't happen every game. Hell, it didn't even happen half the games. If the second tank, Hoglover69, wanted to play Hog that day, he was gonna play Hog that day. So although Ryan Zarya may have been peak to some, the reality is, most of the time, that's not what happened. What people really like about Reinhardt is Reinhardt. Being able to hit swings, hit fire strikes, land pins, land shatters, but all of these things got buffed. So why does this gameplay feel like it's lacking now more than ever? Why does a good game feel less like you're popping off and more like you're just not feeding? It's simple, because despite his kit getting buffed, most of it doesn't translate to kills. And to that, we can thank mobility creep, which is every new hero as well as some old getting mobility, but also things like Suzu. The fix for Reinhardt is to just give him consistency. Reinhardt's pin should deal 300 damage. That's enough to one-shot Reaper and Mei. There's no reason why any non-tank hero that walks into a loud, grunting German man doing an extremely telegraphed movement should live if immortality isn't involved. The next thing that needs a consistency check is Fire Strike. In Season 9, most two shots in the game got nerfed. This in part was intended to reduce the amount of random kills. Overall, it was a good change for the game, but also a big nerf to Reinhardt because double fire strike was his only ranged threat. I think an exception can be made when we're talking about an incredibly slow and obvious projectile like fire strike. Hashtag bring back double fire strike. Lastly, shatter. With what I mentioned earlier about mobility creep and cleanse, it just about evens out for the fact that there's less shields in Overwatch 2. But even isn't what we want. Tank in Overwatch 2 is supposed to be better. So by that logic, Shatter needs to be better. All that said and done, I think buffing the knockdown duration on non-tanks will go a long way in making Reinhardt feel like Reinhardt again. Alright, let's switch it up a bit and talk about a newer hero, Ramatra. 
Ramatra is a tank that's been pretty sleeper strong for a while, but strong does not equal fun. When Ramatra released, I played him a lot and at a high level. I, I got rank 1 with the guy. But the high didn't last for long because as time passed on, I just played him less and less. And some of that can be a product of metas and balance changes. But the main thing that stopped me is how helpless I felt when it came to CC. It felt like if the enemy team had an Ana or a Risa, I had to wait for them to use their cooldowns before I could start playing the game. And if they didn't use their cooldowns, then I asked myself, what's for dinner? Because at this rate, I can make a nice egg and banana sandwich, eat it, come back before it's my turn to play the game. The reason it feels like this is because as Ram, the only countermeasure for CC is the deployable shield. And that ability is gone longer than it lasts. But that's fine. That's not the ability that needs changes. Hear me out. I've got this totally original and never before suggested idea. So Ramatra has this nemesis form ability, right? He can punch and he can block. What if his block blocked CC? Wait, before you say anything, I know what you're thinking. As he is right now, eh, that'd be kind of broken. And you're absolutely correct. So let's start to add some trade-offs. What if he couldn't move while blocking? If you're chasing an Ana down and you predict a sleep, you get to continue chasing, but on the other hand, if you mispredict, you either get slept or end up out of range. This would also apply to boops, since they can be just as bad if not worse than stuns, but in the end, it makes the game more of a game for both players and less of a mindless cooldown dump on the tank. As an unintended side effect, he won't be able to tiptoe while blocking in his ultimate, so adding an extra second or two to the duration should make up for it. Okay, so with that out of the way, the last change Ram needs is an increased height on Vortex. There's no reason why this ability shouldn't reach all the way up to the skybox. Ramatra is almost competing with Reinhardt for the worst tank when it comes to dealing with flyers. Skybox Vortex would be a great way to introduce counterplay while also opening up some cool plays. Altogether, these changes end up being a net buff to Ramatra, who is already a strong hero, so some dials elsewhere might need to be turned down. For example, his nemesis form movement speed or pummel range. I have to emphasize again that with all these changes, the goal isn't to make one hero the best. It's to make them all generally more playable, and a big part of that is addressing what makes them unplayable. With that being said, let's talk about a hero that I found to be very playable, Zarya. Zarya has been one of my comfort picks throughout Overwatch 2. Whenever tanking feels miserable, I could always fall back to her as the tank that could fight back against most of the BS in the game. It goes without saying, it's because bubble block stuns and boops. So by default, Zarya is already a tank that can outplay most counters, and because of that, changes she needs aren't going to be as dramatic as the others on this list. I'll start by saying, she's a little too hard to outplay. Everyone knows to shoot Zarya when she uses both bubbles, but not everyone knows when she uses both bubbles. Even if you on an individual level are trying your best to track them, there are times where you can't afford to stare at the Zarya or times she bubbles someone out of sight. What I'm trying to say is, unless Zarya uses both bubbles out in the open, it could be hard to find a punish window. Some kind of visual to show that would go a long way. Just to name an example, glowing bright bubble when she has one or varying opacity depending on how far off she is on the next one. That's enough of that, let's talk about snipers. Hate those guys, think they should be deleted from the game, but assuming they're staying in the game, Zarya has no good way of dealing with them. So if the map is unfavorable, the only outplay is to swap to a dive tank or a shield tank. What if there were a third option though, one that didn't involve swapping? What if Zarya had some kind of tool to at least pressure snipers? Oh, I, I guess she has that alternate fire thing, but it's kind of slow, and you have to aim it really high the further they are. Well, as much as I love the arc on the secondary fire, increasing the projectile speed would go a long way for pressuring snipers. On the same train of thought though, she'll need a reduced cost for ammo. That way she can chuck one or two extra right clicks, but also so she has a little bit more beam pressure on the barrier heroes that counter her like Reinhardt or Winston. And bada bing bada boom, that's a wrap for Zarya changes. Moving on to the next tank, we have Junker Queen. She actually doesn't need much, but she does need something. For starters, we need to remove the range cap on Gracie. This ability was clearly inspired by tomahawks and throwing knives from Call of Duties, so just let people trick shot. Imagine all the cool clips and plays Overwatch would be farming with cross-map Gracie kills. Not only that, but this also gives Queen some kind of pressure on snipers or heroes on the just out of range high grounds, which like many tanks, she is hard countered by them. 
Continuing that thought, give her ultimate verticality. Most of the time, Junker Queen will still use the ultimate grounded since it's the best way to get the most players, but if she has the option to hit high ground with it every couple fights, then it will help a lot in making her a more flexible tank. Okay, so we talked about two tanks that struggle with high grounds. How about one that doesn't? Let's talk about D.Va. D.Va is a hero whose main counters in Overwatch 2 are Zarya and having an inconsistent ultimate. Before we get to either of those two things, is it just me or does it feel like D.Va's Matrix lasts forever? I sure wish there was a visual indicator to let me know that it's running low. Maybe it could change colors, or the opacity lowers, or maybe it starts blinking something, anything. It's a very similar issue to what we mentioned earlier with Zarya. If Zarya's bubbles got a visual indicator, it would make the punish window more clear, and in turn, maybe the D.Va vs Zarya matchup wouldn't be so one-sided if the D.Va knew when to mow her down. Imagine if barriers like Reinhardt's or Winston didn't have a cracking visual. You wouldn't know to keep shooting or not. I'm just saying that information goes a long way. Anyways, let's focus on our ultimate, Self-Destruct. This is an ultimate that's at the mercy of the map geometry, but it's also not helped by immortalities, mobility creep, and less players in the game, yada 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 the stuff I've been saying this whole time. Overall, it's a lot harder to secure kills with Bomb. Not only that, but throw in the fact that tank becomes a liability, and you have an ultimate that just got worse in transition. My proposed buff is to make Pilot Diva respawn in place if she dies while ulting. No, it doesn't call the mech and do the squish damage, it just respawns her in place with a visual similar to Echo's copy. This gives D.Va a chance to make plays with her ultimate rather than to play scared. The extra pressure from Pilot D.Va can translate to kills, whether it be from Bunny Blaster or scaring enemies into peeking the self-destruct. Now we'll talk about a hero that needs a bigger rework, Roadhog. Yep, he just got reworked, and in my opinion, he needs another. The good news is, the rework won't require any new abilities, just a change in direction. Roadhog's whole gameplay loop revolves around all inning on the hook to shotgun combo. Because of this, he's very easy to counter. Just use abilities that deny the hook or punish him after he uses it. So for the sake of him not being a one-dimensional tank, here's the changes Roadhog needs, but Roadhog players probably aren't ready to hear. We'll start with the nerfs. His gun takes three body shots to kill. Gone are the days of hook shoot being anywhere close to one tapping or even two tapping. Next up, pig pen. We're keeping that ability and it still slows, but now it does less damage. Now here's the buffs. Roadhog has a tighter spread on his shotgun and less fall off damage. This way he can use it more for poking heroes that are out of hook range. As for pig pen, if it's not already activated, he can jump on it like a trampoline and bounce the high ground. This not only helps him challenge high grounds, but can also set up for some stylish trampoline hook combos. Which reminds me, his hook is also getting buffed. It now slows enemies, but does not stack with pig pen slow. The reason for slow on hook is since Hog has a little less frontline pressure off raw damage, he'll be using the slow on hook to peel himself and allies a lot more. Lastly, whole hog has an increased knockback again and it no longer headshots, making it less of an insta-kill and more of a make the enemy disengage go off the map, or slowly die in the corner. Overall, Roadhog needs big changes to become flexible and not broken in either direction. Now let's talk about the other round tank, Wrecking Ball. This is a hero who, much like Roadhog, lost a chunk of their playstyle in transition to Overwatch 2. And with the current format, it's never coming back. But that doesn't mean we can't make something similar or better. The big change Ball needs to become a more flexible solo tank is an option against his counters. My suggestion is, when adaptive shields are activated, the initial 1-2 to two seconds grants him CC immunity. It doesn't make him unbeatable, but it creates a mind game with the stunner and the stunny. Do I stun early or do I stun late? If you ask me, there's a lot more interaction than, oh hey, Ball is rolling in the straight line, I will sleep him, or Ball is mid-air, just hack him. There will definitely need to be some tweaks to his HP or adaptive shields to balance things out. I'm not going to throw any numbers out there just because it's got to be tested. Big one done, now there's a couple small changes he needs. Firstly, allow grapple out of spawn. If Kiriko can TP cleanse out of spawn and Doomfist can turn punch 360 head bounce out of spawn, I don't see a good enough argument for why Ball can't spawn in with grapple. This was a change to combat stalling when there was 12 players in a game and 2 CP existed. Neither of those things are true anymore, so I think it's about time to bring it back. Next, let's increase the time before grapple breaks by 2 seconds. 
Once again, this is another change made for Overwatch 1 to combat stalling, but seeing that he's a solo tank now, an extra second or two can go a long way for playmaking. Moving on to Minefield, let's remove the cast time. Nobody is interrupting a 0.1 second cast time on purpose. I know we had loot boxes in Overwatch 1, but it's time to stop rewarding gamblers. Lastly, buff Minefield in general. With Season 9 increasing everyone's health pool, two mines no longer kill. Combine that with the fact we're adding another hero that clears mines in every way possible. The ultimate is factually worse than it's ever been, and arguably the current worst among the tanks. If it's not going to two-tap anymore, then buffing the health per mine will go a long way in making it actually zone, and not just a reason for enemies to use one ability and clear them. Now, let's talk about Overwatch's most recent problem tank, Mauga. Since day one, shooting tanks has been his greatest strength, and greatest weakness. His kit requires him to shoot tanks so that he can sustain, which creates these massive jumps in viability, where in tank matchups like Hog and Winston, he deletes them while also getting infinite self heals. But then, versus Sigma or Diva, he does nothing and ends up getting starved of heals. In short, Mauga needs to be less reliant on shooting tanks. How do we fix this? The answer has been in our faces this whole time. Reward Mauga for shooting squishy heroes. Make the single fire more accurate and increase the rate at which he builds shields. Give dual fire either more fall off damage or less accuracy. The goal should be to make it only viable for shooting enemies at point blank or for breaking barriers. Next, Overrun needs CC immunity on Windup. This ability gives Mauga a chance to outplay stuns and boops, but as it is, the first second winding up makes it too difficult to outplay anything reactively, and with how long the windup is, you can't even outplay most things predictably. Next up, Cardiac Overdrive. Instead of healing for damage, it should be increased fire rate and reload. And it should probably only apply to him. This will make it so that Mauga gets shields at an even faster rate, making dual minis slightly more viable, but also making him rely less on healing, and in turn, making his greatest counter, Anti-Nade, a little less effective. Lastly, we gotta increase or remove the cast time on Cage Fight. Ultimate should be cancelled on purpose or not at all. Don't know why this is a hot take. Winning a game off cancelling Cage Fight isn't winning because you're better, it's winning because you're lucky. Please, save the luck for the casinos. Moving on to the next tank, we have Sigma. Sigma is a weird tank. He's permanent meta on Circuit Royale and Havana because shield versus sniper is good, but everywhere else, he's somewhere between a safe pick and a questionable pick. His main weakness is that he gets run over or run past, but even those weaknesses are covered pretty decent by his kit. The only thing I can suggest is maybe a passive that grants a 5% base movement speed bonus, just so the old guy has a little more to keep up with the faster fights. Oh, and rock into shoot melee combo should kill most squishy heroes. As of season 9 health changes, it does not. Let's talk about the next tank, Battle Cattle, aka Orisa. Orisa may just be the people's most hated tank, and there's two reasons for that. First, is she has two forms of CC, the Spinner and the Javelin. Second, is that she's hard to punish thanks to her armor, fortify, and once again, the spinner. So if the problem is both of these things together and not just one, why not introduce something similar to a shared cooldown like an overheat mechanic? If Arisa uses two cooldowns in quick succession, then she's locked out of the third one for two seconds. This does a couple things. If Arisa pushes someone with spinner and spear, it's an all-in play that can be punished since she can't fortify for two seconds. If she chooses not to immediately combo abilities, then the victim has a CC free moment to fight back. So obviously this is a net nerf for Orisa, we gotta give her a little summon something to compensate. And to that I say, let Orisa fly. The people have been asking for this, and the people are getting restless. Make it happen Blizzard. Finally, let's talk about her ultimate. This is by far the most boring part of her kit. The coolest thing about it is you can pull people off the map, but that's like 1 in 100 Orisa ults. So here's how we make it fun. Let the ultimate push. So initially it pulls like always, but then on release, it does a knockback to everyone inside. This adds a lot of versatility to the ultimate between setting up more environmental kills, but also creating opportunities to push someone out of position. And finally, for our last tank, Doomfist. Tank Doomfist will never manage to make all the Overwatch 1 Doom mains happy. He's a similar hero, but also a very different one. Accepting that fact, it's not too hard to say that Doomfist 
is in a good place right now. Having two burst mobility options gives him a lot of room to dodge the cooldowns that are supposed to counter him. Add in the fact that Block gives him frontline presence while also potentially giving him a punish or third mobility option, the guy is already more flexible than most dive tanks. Personally, I'm not a fan of Empowered Punch getting charged off dumb players, especially since they're always on my team, but that's a topic for another video. One small change he could use is to allow him to contest while ulting. If Venture and Reaper can do it, why can't an ulting Doomfist? On that same note, make his ultimate visible when moving around the map. I know visual clutter is a concern, so just make it like one thin red line or something. Just a tiny visual would help a lot. Just like that, we're about done covering every tank and my way of making them work in 5v5. Let me know down in the comment section if you guys liked any of the changes or if you have your own, be sure to comment that too. You never know, someone who could make the change happen might just see it. Anyways, if you found this video to be interesting, be sure to like, subscribe, and turn that bell icon on. As always, thank you for watching and good luck on the grind.